So I guess we can just begin with our start beginning. So welcome everybody who's here. I, uh, my name is Lindsay and I am the secretary for the CSAAM leadership. And today I'm very excited to share with you our uh, presentation on direct care and deaccessioning. And just some quick introduction, Zoom logistics. Um, this is a webinar, so you are muted. I do ask that if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and use the chat for chatting. Uh, we will get to your questions at the end of the session. I will be moderating. If you encounter any technical difficulties, there is um, some troubleshooting on the Zoom website. Worst case scenario, please email me at lpalaima at calacademy.org. I will be moderating my email as well. So hopefully I can assist with anything. Uh, today, I'm, I'm excited to um, introduce our speakers. We have Robin Lawrence, Ann Young, and Jennifer Rigsby, all from Newfields. I don't know how to say all the longer title, but <laughs> they are colleagues and they're excited, hopefully, to share everything that they've been doing. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and disappear and mute. And when you guys just holler out when you want your slide to change to the next one. Sure, thank you so much, Lindsay. Uh, my name's Robin Lawrence. I'm the manager of curatorial affairs at the Indianapolis Museum of Art at Newfields. And today's webinar will cover our institution's approach to deaccessioning the program that we've established and the steps we've taken to create the systematic process, how we define direct care and the utilization of it at our institution. But we wanna start by saying that we are covering legal and ethical topics today. So this is a gentle reminder that this is not legal advice and your counsel should always be consulted on the issues that we cover. Can I get the next slide, Lindsay? Thank you. So I'm gonna to start today with an overview of our approach to deaccessioning, and then Jennifer will speak about laying the groundwork for this program and how we track our deaccession funds. And then Anne's gonna wrap up the webinar with a review of Newfield's newly approved deaccession policy and a bit of demystifying the uh, various industry statements that have come out recently about direct care language. So a bit of background about Newfields. We are a 137 year old institution. We're located in an urban area in Indianapolis on 152 acres. This includes an art museum, a garden, art and nature park, a historic house, and we're also stewards of a Aracerin designed house in Columbus, Indiana called Miller House. So we have a lot of different properties and interests at our institution. So Newfields has always had a relatively consistent deaccession program, but in 2015, when a new strategic plan was drafted, it included language that sought to review our whole collection to come up with a holistic approach for deaccessioning and reviewing so that we had a better idea of what our strengths and weaknesses are. After 137 years, you obviously have a lot of objects floating around and our institution had started to refine how it approached collecting and we revised our mission. We went through rebranding and became new fields. So there were a lot of different things going on around this time period when Jennifer and I began the collection ranking project, which was created thanks to the wording in this strategic plan. Since then, we've deaccessioned 6,021 objects, primarily through sale at auction or transfer to another institution. We've ranked 50,000 plus objects in our collection by using an A through D grading system. And I'll get to that in a little bit more detail in a second. And the project has helped us reach a point where we are today that has a systematic, consistent, and holistic approach to deaccessioning. We're able to do this through consistency. Our art committee, which is our name for our collections committee, meets four times a year. And we present deaccessions at every single meeting. We begin deaccessioning, we began deaccessioning on a regular basis once we've appraised committee members of what this process was going to be and our approach to it to ensure that not only were they on board but they'd be aware of what to anticipate at each meeting so the process and the ranking wasn't catching them off guard and we presented often at collections rank at art committee meetings about the collection ranking project and i can't stress enough how having your art committee or your collections committee members on board is pretty critical to the success of any deaccession program. For us, keeping the project consistent was helped by uh, figuring out how the workload would work. 
we chart our groups for deaccession about a year and a half in advance. So for example, our fiscal year starts July 1, and we had our groups set for the entire fiscal year by January of the previous year. So that helps us begin to identify groups for deaccession with each curator, so they don't feel stressed quarterly before each art committee. This also helps us get the paperwork in order, figure out any trouble spots that we might encounter with upcoming meeting or donor relations. And then we could begin to work with potential auction houses or institutions that might be interested in transfer of objects. And we've always had clear goals in mind for the project. Not only did it stem from the original strategic plan, but there was a long-term goal of refining the color refining the collection to create a collecting plan that would help us chart a course for the years to come in our curatorial department, particularly in the area of acquiring underrepresented artists and diversifying the collection. So having these specific goals helped us ensure that everyone from curators to registrars to collection support were prioritizing the process and that it didn't just die on the vine once we'd come up with this idea. Obviously, the issue of space is pervasive in our field, and the IMA is no different. With 50,000 objects on site in storage, adding on to our footprint wasn't of interest, and purchasing off site storage wasn't something that we wished to pursue. So, cleaning out the basement, so to speak, seemed like an option in terms of giving direct care to objects. As our cabinets and hanging storage were hitting critical mass, it was imperative that we could find a solution that would provide the best care to the objects that we have and for the objects that we wish to continue to collect as we are an actively collecting institution. So some of the things we were able to do by providing more space in the cabinets was create more earthquake boxes. You might be surprised to know that Indiana is on a fault line. We were able to upgrade our older housing for some of the objects and give more breathing space between them, rearranging cabinets, providing space for incoming objects, and prioritizing our storage needs were some of the projects we were able to complete. And the goal of the project wasn't merely to deaccession, but to better understand the collection that we have. We collected masses of data through this project by ranking every object A through D, A being a masterwork and D being a duplicate, not mission related or something that we would never show. And we were able to record all of that plus our curatorial rationale from the curator's mouths into EMU, which is our database. We can now search our database to find how many works fall into each of these categories. We've completed a prioritization of photography and conservation assessment, so we know which objects we would like to photograph each year, which ones are critical to get into conservation, and this is all because we've laid eyes on all 50,000 objects in our collection over the past year. I'm sorry, not year, years. Uh, improving storage conditions and gaining deeper knowledge of the collection, these systemizations that we've created is defining the definition of providing direct care to our collection. Thus, we've equated the implementation and follow through of the project as direct care uh, to the objects at the IMA. We've applied our funds appropriately and in accordance with the recommendations of AAM. And we'll talk a little bit more about AAMD um, once Anne's up to bat. But for the areas that we have applied deaccession funds thus far are project-based temporary staffing, shipping, honoraria for outside scholars that contribute knowledge to our collection through the project, and collections care and conservation. The last piece I want to touch on is transparency. We've always kept the entire process 100% transparent. Our deaccessions and the process is certainly reliant on this, as we all know, uh, and we certainly could find ourselves in sticky situations if these were not well recorded and documented. And in our case, we keep our policy on our website, and you can find that on the blue hyperlink that I have in the PowerPoint, and once this is shared with everyone after the presentation, you can access that there, but you'll find that on Newfield's website. And we also, <clears throat> excuse me, we also, once the work is deaccessioned, include the provenance of where it has traveled to. And we actually have an example of that here. Lindsay, would you mind advancing the slide, please? Thank you. So here's a sculpture from our Chinese department that was deaccessioned in 2018. And you can see in the object information area on the right-hand side of the screen, the date in which it was deaccessioned, and that means when it was approved by a board of trustees, and when it was sold and where. So it sold at Christie's, and it mentions the sale on the lot. So all provenance information has been retained and is available for this piece, and for all of our pieces that are deaccessioned. 
And lastly, can I get the ne next slide, please, Lindsay? <laughs> Thank you. So here's an example of the collection ranking criteria that we use at Newfields. This is obviously an art focus since we are an art museum, but it is completely customizable for any other institution or fields of collecting that would be interested in using such a system. If you are considering a deaccession project or a systemization at your institution, I'd highly recommend creating a formal set of criteria so that the data gleaned from the project is retained and that's also searchable in your database and understandable to people who are in our position year and we're all retired and enjoying a beach somewhere. But this data has really been transformative for our institution and how we function. Not only has it aided in identifying what we wish to deaccession, but we now require all new acquisitions to be ranked, including gifts, when they come into the museum. And it has given us a much clearer picture of where our strengths and weaknesses are. And as we've now created a collecting plan um, out of our curatorial department, it has identified areas of potential growth for us too. And so with that, I will pass it to Jennifer. Hello everyone, I'm Jennifer Rigsby. I'm the Associate Registrar for Collections at uh, Newfields. And so um, as Robin had mentioned before, Newfields has been deaccessioning in some capacity since the 1930s. And uh, I joined the museum in 2014, but before I was hired, deaccessioning was put on a moratorium. So once I was hired, it was a goal to get the process going again. And it, for 2014, it was just kind of me getting familiar with the process and the way it was done at Newfields, but it wasn't really going to pick up steam until it became an institutional goal. So building the groundwork for this project, we did a couple of things. Uh, the deaccession policy was revised in 2015 and it expanded direct care for the institution to cover specific costs directly associated with such acquisitions after operating funds had been reviewed or exhausted on a case-by-case -case basis for acquisitions and deaccessions to cover things like framing, mounting, photography, conservation, staffing, packing, transportation, evaluation, sales fees, and processing costs. Also in 2015, the ranking project was getting started. Robin was the lead on that. And so um, as that was getting rolling, the deaccession pro policy was being revised. Um, I wanted to also address languishing loans and found and collection objects that were also hanging out in storage. And at the time, Indiana's museum property law would have required me to wait seven years before I could have started processing those. And that's just, that's too long. So I emailed our COO, Katie Haig, with proposed revisions to the law. And so we got in contact with our local representative they proposed it at the 2016 session and it became a law in, after July 1st, 2016. So it significantly cut down on the time that we had to wait, especially for uh, found in collection objects. They only had to be at the museum for three years where formerly it was seven years. And so we could just change really helped the museum process these undocumented objects that had been languishing in storage for decades at this point. Lindsay, can I get the next slide, please? So as we've all seen in the numerous articles that have been published since AAMD has uh, put out its guide, there are many outside the field who are worried that museums are going to start pulling a Monet off the wall and selling it to fund some operating costs. But for new fields with the combination of ranking the collection, a clear deaccession poly policy, and an institutional tactic of consistent deaccessioning. It led us to increased numbers of works of art leaving the building to be sold, but they were thoroughly vetted before they left. So a good place to start for your institution may be your low-hanging fruit, and so that's what, for Newfields, it was the founding collection pieces. So we were able to claim clear title to 1,170 found and collection objects. 714 of those have been sold. And these pieces are not generally getting large amounts of money when they are sold, but they are freeing up desperately needed storage space, which to me was absolutely worth it. And then 
our next goal is to continually, continually work through abandoned loans. So we're auditing all receipts with the help of volunteers and interns. And we're constantly tracking them through the inventory. And it's already led to some resolution thanks to the shorter time frame in the, the law. We've been able to get clear title to 586 pieces that are part of an ancient Egyptian and Roman collection that have been on site at the museum since 1914. So they were well overdue getting a title transferred to the museum. And then the curators have been able to accession nine pieces through this process. So it is more time consuming going through abandoned loans, but it's definitely paying off for us. And there is a reason deaccessioning cannot be done properly without the registrars due to the need for highly organized and detailed record keeping. And no one accomplished this better than Sherry Peglo, our registrar for collections, who manages all art purchase funds at the museum. Seriously, she's a gold star registrar. So all funds are received from the sale of deaccessioned items are tracked in our collections management system, which we currently use KBE Emo. So uh, the IMA fund tab is where we track any fund restrictions that are identified from the donor or um, maybe their institution uh, restrictions. And then the fund earnings tab, this is where we record when a work of art is sold, all the information is tracked in a table that you'll see an, an example of down below. That's an example I completely made up, so it's nothing real from our database. And so we keep track of the credit line in this table that's gonna be attached to any new purchases. So we track everything, even if something's only sold for a penny in a lot with 20 other objects, we track it here. We also track the payments made from any art purchase fund. Uh, the Newfields Finance Department also keeps track of the funds and both systems are reconciled monthly. If funds are pulled for direct care use, it is tracked here. Fund reports are made available to the Art Committee and Board of Trustees quarterly. And so all of this with links within our database so we can track exactly what object was purchased using deaccession funds. And with that, I will turn it over to Anne. Thank you, Robin and Jennifer. Uh, I'm Ann Young. I'm the Director of Legal Affairs and Intellectual Property at New Fields. And so where I came into the process in working on the deaccessions for New Fields was really when uh, a little over, about, well, about a year ago, maybe a little bit more, uh, we worked to update the deaccession policy that we have. And so that was a cross-departmental team, including the three of us on today's panel, as well as additional representatives from our curatorial department, registration department, um, and our COO, Katie Haig, um, kind of all sitting down, reviewing what was then the current policy and outlining where we wanted to update it. One of the first things that we did in working through this as a cross-departmental team was really looking at the deaccession policy that we had at the time and stripping out of it anything that was really more procedural and putting that into a separate process document that could be maintained that understanding that some of the process and the exact how you get from A to Z is going to change over time, but that it doesn't necessarily affect the policy and change that. So really detailing and figuring out what our policy was going to be and notable to that was actually defining direct care. So that was within um, uh, section D of our newly approved deaccession policy. And when I say newly approved, like literally last week approved by our board. Uh, so just got that through. Um, but in section D, under use of proceeds, very clearly defining what direct care is uh, for us. And so for us, that is point three that you see on your screen here. And to support the direct care of collections, including but not not limited to framing, mounting, photography, conservation, staffing, packing, transportation, evaluation, and sales fees. And this was very important for us and the continuation of the work through the ranking project and the overall deaccession project uh, to continue moving these works forward. Okay, next slide.
And so this work to update our deaccession policy was really building off of the work of AAM and FASB um, and looking at the guidelines that they have put out. Um, so AAM had the direct care white paper that they first put out in 2016, which was updated in March of 2019. And that update in March 2019 was to reflect the updated accounting standards put out by FASB uh, in, that, in, in March of 2019 as well. And so looking at the update of our the accession policy really bringing us in alignment with AM and FASB, allowing for the use of proceeds for the direct care um, from that sale of deaccession collection objects. Um, this is, I think, important to note that with AAM, it's a recommendation that you have direct care language in your uh, deaccession policy, but it is not a requirement. However, it is a requirement of FASB that you have and disclose what the institution's definition is for direct care within your deaccession policy. Um, while AAMs is still listed as a recommendation in the white paper, it is something that with that alignment and the inclusion and in needing to be um, accountable to the FASB standards as well, that realistically it's almost kind of by extension now a kind of quasi requirement of AM as well, um, needing to be in line with both of those. Um, and then as uh, Robin alluded to, we have the most recent issuance coming from AAMD last month um, with their resolution that was passed. Uh, important to note here with AAMD, um, obviously AAMD's resolution being passed um, really only applies to art museums um, and there are plenty of non-art museums that will have deaccession programs and be uh, held to AAM and FASB standards. Um, but with AAMD's resolution, um, having a similar requirement as FASB that you need to clearly define what direct care is uh, AMD also requires that that definition and uh, of direct care within your deaccession policy be board approved um, and publicly available. Uh, and finally, really important to note with AMDs, uh, it is only effective through April 10th of 2022. Next slide. So I uh, kind of wanted to leave you today with some general thoughts that Team Newfields has uh, if you are considering a deaccession policy update for your institution. Um, so first, gather all of the cross-departmental brains. Um, this is not something that is going to be easily done by a single person. So having a multitude of people around the, around the table and representing different departments is really key to having a really well thought out policy to present. Make sure it is written um, and update your deaccession policy um, with that definition of direct care within it. Um, and whether that policy is viewed as being part of your collections management policy or just a, a subsection of it um, or something um, separate but in alignment, uh, making sure it's all written out. Presenting that to your governing body for review and approval. That can be either at a regularly scheduled meeting or through holding an emergency proxy vote um, if there is a matter of urgency, um, in which case if you are perhaps an art museum wanting to abide by AMD's uh, new, newest resolution and needing to get something very quickly so that you can move forward with the accessions and direct care that you might need to consider some sort of a emergency proxy vote versus waiting for a next regularly scheduled meeting of your governing body. Uh, at the end of the day though, any accession policy and putting it into action and updating that language, it's about making good decisions and being good stewards for the collections in our care. And we need to act in good faith to balance the current needs of our institutions with the future needs of our institutions. Thank you. Okay, sorry, I'm happy to need to, there we as go. we had expected, <laughs> figure out all the technology. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> so as we had expected, we thought that this would have quite a few questions afterwards about process, and um, I'm happy to have Lindsay kind of farm those out to us. Um, but we wanted to leave a lot of time in this presentation for anyone to shoot us those questions. Um, if they're granular about your institution, we'll try our hardest to answer them. Um, but we know that there have been a lot of changes recently to um, base 
primarily off of AAMD's statement about direct care and um, how we've applied that here or our deaccession program. And we're happy to answer your questions and queries. Thank you guys. Um, I wanted to just point out that Anne did share a link to their uh, Newfields deaccession policy um, in the chat. So if you want to open the Zoom chat, you will see that link. Uh, so I'm just going to go in the order that the questions arrived. Uh, the first one was, who sits on your ARC committee? And did you encounter any objections from the committee on your deaccession approach? Well, this is a great question. It has recently changed. Um, and excuse me if I do say collections committee, because it was collections committee for decades and decades. And just this past year, it became ARC committee. So you will often find those of us at Newfields going by the old name, but um, Art Committee is based for, on partially board members, existing board members. Uh, sometimes there are members that have been on the board in the past or other people that have invested interests in new fields. So the way it is compiled today, our chair of the board of trustees at new fields is also the chair of Art Committee. And we have 10 voting members on our art committee, including our director, Charles Venable. And then we also have the most recent past board of trustees president and chair. So an emeritus member also, and then a variety of, of different members of either the community or the different boards at Newfields. And the reason that it recently underwent this reshuffling was that it was imperative that we have members on the art committee that are very familiar with the institution and very familiar with our goals and the direction in which the museum is going. Very often art committees, which I've been told from several museums are the committees that people wanna be on because it's fun to hear what's going on with your art collections or your collections in general. Um, but we were finding that the members weren't necessarily as in tune with the direction in which the institution was going. So that included a new strategic plan, which we're rewriting again now this year, and uh, these the collection ranking project. So that's who is on our committee today. And that sort of dovetails, and I think you covered it, but does your art committee collections committee meet to cover all the art departments? And it sounds yeah. like yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. It does. And, and not every single department is deaccessioning in each art committee. It really depends on the workload that Jennifer and our project specialists can accomplish, but also the, what the load of the curator is. It might be a combination of five European paintings, 100 decorative arts, and 200 textiles. Um, you just kind of don't know. It's based on the you know, master document Jennifer and I draw up about a year and a half out. Um, so yes, the, there's only one art committee, or one committee at the museum that can approve the accessions, and that's the art committee. Great, and um, so the next question was, how do you suggest museums deal with deaccessioning in states without museum property laws? <laughs> I, can t I can take this one. That's okay. not me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I would suggest looking at what other states are doing around you and draft your own legislation. I took the draft that existed for Indiana. I looked at, I believe, Ohio and I think Minnesota who had much more progressive law than we did. And I just edited it and I sent it to our COO and said, hey, this is something we need to make a priority. And we happened to have a Senator at the time sitting on one of our boards. And so we met with him, talked it over, and then he proposed it on our behalf. So if you don't have access to someone who can help you on your board, uh, try to get to know who your local representatives are. I think it'll, it'll pay off for you, but also check with states around you to see what they're doing. All right, and then this question was, how many staff, permanent and temporary, interns and volunteers in the registrar's office worked on these projects? And then sort of to go with that, there's another one of how much time did curatorial staff commit to ranking the ranking project and how were you able to get their support? Sort of the staffing and hours. I can let Robin cover the curatorial piece of that, but uh, for the registrar's office, I am the registrar responsible for deep sessionings. And when I started in 2014, uh, 
I knew what I had my work cut out for me to say the least. Uh, so since I started at the museum, I've had 25 volunteers and interns who have helped me with this project. So they've done things from photographing objects in storage, they've done measurements, they've done research and files for me, they've created beautiful binders with all kinds of information that that's just been great with this project. So 25 interns and volunteers and then now we have three temporary positions, our project specialists that are taking on more of the roles that the interns and volunteers were doing for me. But I always like to have an intern or volunteer. So if anybody's looking in the fall, you know, Newfields is a great place to come intern and volunteer. Get some great experience. Uh, so from the curatorial side of things, um, and I'll kind of address this two different ways because a lot of the time kind of depended on the ability to wrangle personalities and expectations too. Um, so when the project started in October of 2015 and I was um, hired for that position as the project manager, it was just kind of like, all right, go and figure it out. So I found the best way to ensure that the curators would meet with me and we went into storage and would look at every object on that day's list. Typically, uh, with a few exceptions, we would just go cabinet by cabinet and I'd bring my laptop and pull up the database and say, all right, these are the 60 Japanese works in this cabinet and we're going to rank them all today. And I'd have a standing meeting on my calendar that had no end date. So the curators knew they were stuck with me until they were done. And we would meet weekly for two hours, which I found to be kind of the sweet spot in terms of being able to, one, stand in storage for that long in dress shoes with a curator and uh, to their uh, attention span. It is, honestly, it is very draining. It takes a lot of critical thinking on their part. And our curators, when we engaged in this project, a lot of them had been at the museum for a very, very long time. So having a really long tenure, they didn't need to do really as much background research in terms of the objects that we were looking at. Whereas some of our younger curators that did start in the middle of the project would need to spend more time on their own researching before we would go to rank. Um, but the, the act of the ranking and, and critically thinking through the objects placed in the museum is, is draining. But we were able to accomplish that in five years, which is pretty impressive, I think. And that is really thanks to the curators uh, being willing to meet with me when our meetings would come up on the calendar and not running the other direction. <laughs> um, so there's been quite a few questions popping up about the accounting. Um, I'm going to try to get this into a more concise. Um, has Newfields had any issues with AAMD using funds for direct care as an art institution? None. <laughs> and I, I would say part of that is that we are following AAMD's rec or AAM's recommendation in the white paper and our level of transparency has always been absolutely top notch on the website and AMD has been waffling for so long about coming out with a statement about direct care. Our director is very involved in AMD, so he knew that we wouldn't be running afoul uh, with these practices. And then there's two. So there's one about are the deaccession funds tracked in the development the development department database, and how do you manage collaboration between development, accounting, and finance? And then another one sort of piggybacking on that was curious if your deaccession funds are in a restricted accounting fund that carries over year to year. So uh, deaccessions, we do meet with the development department and let them know what is being deaccessioned, but they're not tracking them to the level that registration of finances where this lot of five lace pieces sold for $12 and it had six credit lines associated with it. And, so on and so forth. So they just, they know that things are being don't, are being deaccessioned from a specific credit line, but they're not tracking them quite as well as we are. And then all of the funds are in um, an art purchase fund, so they roll over year to year. 
and I'm forgetting what the third part was. I think that was if there was any sort of cross between finance development. Oh, it, yes. We, uh, we meet quite regularly with development and finance uh, just to see how things are going, make sure that, you know, if a check is sent and it goes somewhere that all three departments are in the know that something's happening. So we try to keep our lines of communication open with all departments. All right. Um, the next question is about um, by staffing as an approved use of deaccessions funds, do you mean the payment of staff salaries and benefits for collections rated personnel? And later on, someone kind of dug deeper on that. Um, is that does that include temporary staff or contract conservators? We haven't we haven't used it for contract conservators, but our justification in in our staffing being paid from deaccession funds is that it's project based. They have a term contract, and our funds do pay for that. So I guess that, that includes healthcare too, but it is one term related. So it relates directly to a project, and the project directly relates to direct care. The people that have been hired are project specialists that Jennifer mentioned. The three of them are photographing and measuring and packing and handling objects and finding lost and deceased donors. So that's absolute direct care and it's not within the bandwidth of those of us that are here in this presentation to continue to do all of those aspects and in addition to the other things that we do in our daily tasks. So the collection ranking project was certainly additive to what we were already doing and bringing in contract staff members has certainly helped us to keep the project on the front burner, to keep it consistent, to keep it running. I know staffing, when Jennifer and I have presented on this before, is always a question that we get because it, it's a lot. Deaccessioning is time consuming and it does take a lot of staff to do it. From the registrars to the curators, the conservators, I mean it's really in all museum, everyone's involved and even development. So having additional staff certainly helps us keep this moving forward. But we do consider what they do every single day as direct care to our collection. All right, um, another question is, should there be a separate deaccession policy from the collections management policy or can it be within the CM policy? Uh, either, <laughs> really. Um, I mean, ideally, if you have your collections management policy, the deaccession policy would be a section of that, um, but you could also have just a completely separate deaccession policy, which is aligned with a broader collections management policy for, you know, what your policy is on accessions versus deaccessions. So either, but either, either way, it's about transparency and accountability. So having that all documented. All right. Um, can you talk about an, any experience with seeking to exchange collections with other cultural institutions? I've not had to do any of that. <laughs> uh, then there's what about deaccessioning of objects that are beyond conservation help? Do you ever need to dispose of objects? We have done that. We have destroyed objects that just, there's nothing that can be done with them. So <laughs> they have been destroyed. Okay. Wow, guys, you are great. There are so many questions coming in. I'm trying to get the <laughs> widest swath of collection of, of questions. Uh, let's see. How do you carry forward the donor credit for direct care cost funds like shipping or evaluation? So if we use funds, say for shipping a new artwork in and then we purchase that work of art, we will have the credit line that we used the funds on shipping, the credit line that we use for purchasing, and any other credit lines that might be attached, all for that one work of art. Um, okay, so I think we may have already answered this, but this got into a little more detail. The registration department tracks the deaccession funds as a budget line item that they control the allocation of, of the funds. The funds are not absorbed back into the larger budgetary assets controlled by the finance department. So 
we collaborate on them. <laughs> so when a curator wants to buy something, they will come to Miss Sherry Peglow and they will say, Sherry, I would like to buy something. Can you tell me what funds I have available? And she will need to know right then and there how much that curator has to spend. So she's relying on finance reporting any donations to her, development reporting any donations to her and accurately tracking that in her database. And then when they reconcile monthly, you know, something might have fallen through the cracks, a check might have come in late or something like that. So the Sherry Peglow is the gatekeeper <laughs> in registration for <laughs> our purchase funds. Uh, typically, how extensive is the curatorial justification when you grade each work of art? And then sort of on top of that is how many staff are involved with ranking and deaccessioning? Sounds like a lot of people. Sure. Well, that is a good question about the curatorial rationale. Um, that it really depends on the object. As Jennifer noted, we have had objects that are absolutely beyond repair or broken and cannot be reassembled. So the justification might just be, it's broken. <laughs> you know, it it's cannot be displayed. It cannot be repaired. Um, other times it involves more scholarship on their end and that's the information that is really good and juicy to retain. As I mentioned earlier, we had two or we had several curators that were very long tenured at the museum. Two of them had been here for 45 years each and they were approaching retirement. So doing the ranking project with them was a fantastic opportunity to glean knowledge that was tucked away in their brain for all these years and to get that into the database. So the object might be an A and it's a masterpiece, it's, it's a Monet, it's wonderful, whatever the situation might be. But then when I was working one-on-one -on -one with them, I would kind of strategically pepper them with questions and say, oh, well, tell me more. Like, why is that a masterpiece? And I'd be sitting here typing on my laptop as they would just be spewing all this knowledge out. So it varies by curator. Some are men or women of few words and some are very verbose, um, but it de definitely had to do with the approach of, of the project. Some curators would even send me justifications later saying, oh, can we please add this? And because it's just something that we can add to our database, it was a really simple fix if something come up. And ranks have changed. We've had a lot of turnover in our contemporary department and I can tell you I have ranked that collection three and a half times. So um, sometimes the ranks would be the same, but it really is in the purview of who's driving that ship and um, what their collecting goals are. So being nimble and keeping that in a database versus in, in a hard copy somewhere, we were able to make those changes and track them. So in terms of who was doing all this work, I would meet with the curators and get all of the information into the database and then hand that over to Jennifer who would do the deaccessioning and we worked that way as a two-person team for I think two and a half years if I'm not maybe three Jennifer um and then we were able to bring in the project specialists and we started with one and now we have three so the five of us are kind of considered a little team and we have touch bases between the five of us because it really is a, a circular project I mean what they do is affects what we do in curatorial and back and forth and um, obviously there are more people involved because we do have advancement review the donor credit lines and all of those things that you need to do before you make it to art committee but the boots on the ground for the ranking project and the deaccessioning there are five of us okay oh, there's so many questions coming in um, so speaking to um, Jennifer, can you tell us about how many acquisitions you process per year? Well, um, we had an average, we did a 10 year acquisition study um, and it was around 900 objects. That was our average. So um, it was a lot for one registrar to be responsible for acquisitions and deaccession hence the 25 interns and volunteers helping me do all of those things. So um, getting these project specialists on the ground and moving uh, really helped speed up the process because as Robin said, we were doing this by ourselves for three years. So if we had a deaccession list and it was slated to go to an auction house, we put it through deaccession. But if it was 
something that we said we'd like to deaccession that, but it had no plan at that time, we didn't pursue it. Now that we have the project specialists on staff, we go ahead and deaccession things without that end goal in mind. All right. Uh, do you think it is best not to return deaccessions to the original donor? Oh, absolutely. No, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. That was unanimous. <laughs> we, we have had instances of a donor wanting an object back. And when they get a very lovely worded explanation from our director, they typically back off. But we do tell them when it's going to be sold, if they'd like to know. We'll say it's going to be sold at this auction on this date and it's this lot. And you're more than welcome to repurchase it if you would like. But no, we, we don't send it back to the donor. Yeah, it, and that really becomes a combination of kind of a conflict of interest, but it could become an issue as well with um, as, assuming that the original donor or their families uh, took the tax credit at the time of when it was don donated um, and given to the museum. It, creates other headaches there as well. Um, so, yeah. All right, Jennifer, this is another question for you. When utilizing interns and volunteers, what sort of access do these individuals have to the objects? Are they allowed to handle the objects and what sort of staff supervision is required? So when any intern or volunteer um, comes on, we put them through an art handling training through the conservation department. And once they um, kind of pass that training, they are allowed to handle objects but it's always under my direct supervision. So they go in storage with me, they open cabinets with me, they photograph pieces with me. They're never on their own. And then do you guys have any cultural art items that might have needed consultation with descendant communities? I'm gonna let you take that one, Anne. Yeah, um, so that's usually actually uh, in the deaccession process where um, I'm brought in a little bit more now um, and really working through where we potentially have any NAGPRA issues um, or any other um, indigenous objects or any works with fall under kind of traditional knowledge um, genre. Uh, needing to review those and consider those. So we, we have we have some. Uh, we're currently slowly working our way through those. Um, but yes, that does present um, an additional consideration um, in wanting to uh, reach out and navigate all of that and making sure we're in compliance, whether it's with NAGPRA or just general uh, goodwill and considering general uh, best practices towards repatriation if it, uh, that is what is eventually needed. Um, when in your deaccession mean process do you confirm a disposal plan? Do you move forward on deaccessions that do not have an avenue for disposal at the time of deaccessioning? We, uh, it's a collaboration with curatorial. I think I started to cut Robin off there. Sorry, but no, yeah. I was, was going to say the same thing. Um, <laughs> our document for that Jennifer and I draft for our deaccession goals for the year, you know, what objects are going to go through what art committee is a real balance between what we know is happening in the calendar and curatorial bandwidth. So if a curator is going to be opening an exhibition in October and art committee is two weeks later, they're not going to have the time to fill out a bunch of paperwork and finish that. So we might put in a curator that we know is not writing extended labels or something at the time. Uh, so it's more a matter of the time ability. And then we group objects in lots that tend to make sense for us. So if it's a textile, it might be European couture or Japanese textiles, because that would be a more substantive group to offer to an auction house. And it makes more sense on our end than to say, all right, great, we've finished this group. We finished the Japanese textiles onto Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. um, it would be more confusing for us to move by location and then have a hodgepodge of different communities, cultures, or countries of origin, but then also the curators and the registrars and the question specialists are doing research in a more scattered shot way. So when we do group the objects, it's more for our convenience and probably their likelihood to be an attractive group at auction. And we begin that process. And once the group has been 
finalized, we will start reaching out to auction houses. And as Jennifer mentioned, a lot of the objects that we have deaccessioned are not they're not Monet's, so they're not necessarily all going to Christie's. So auction houses might not be interested and we have to get a little more creative. So very often we will have deaccessioned, we do right now, plenty of deaccessioned objects that are still seeking their next home that are in storage, but now that they're deaccessioned, we can manage them a little bit differently in, for the work that we do and um, lot them in even bigger groups as, as they kind of in storage. Um, and then Robin, how do you account for curatorial bias for these different types of art? That's a great question. <laughs> um, I say our curators, and I have to give them so much credit for engaging in this project with me because it has been time consuming. Um, I'd say we don't encounter the curatorial bias, but there are certainly areas that are curators who are in charge of collections that have a lot of breadth occasionally they're not experts necessarily in everything. Um, take our decorative arts collection, for example. That's everything from contemporary design that was created this year to ceramics that are hundreds of years old and clearly designed and created in a very different manner. So the difference in, I'd say, the type of collection is kind of where we find um, more of a hiccup. And it doesn't mean that the curator has favorites. I mean, of course they do, but in their approach, it might take a little bit more research. So what we need to account for, I, I really did not encounter much bias. Everyone has their favorites, but that doesn't, just because you don't like Renoir doesn't mean that you're going to deaccession it. Um, so I think the, the larger hiccup was we encounter areas where the curator would need to pump the brakes a bit and say, I need to do a little bit more research and make sure that I'm making a good fiduciary decision and a good being a good steward. And our fabulous curatorial staff would, would do that. And obviously they were given that grace and time to make sure that they're not ranking something a D just because they weren't familiar with it. And, um, and then that great information that they'd glean from the research would go into the database and into their ranking rationale. Great. Um, has CITES kept you from deaccessioning specific objects? We go ahead and deaccession like pieces that have ivory, coral, or other things like that. We, they're just not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say with that, it's not that it affects our ability to deaccession, but it's the disposal. Um, of those objects. And so, you know, looking at things where we can, we can deaccession them. And uh, right now we, you know, deaccession them and we still have those um, that we are holding on to and storing, but with the hope that then if, when uh, CITES laws change and we are able to dispose of those in whatever means that might be, that we will have already gone through the process of deaccessioning them. And so we would be able to quickly move forward um, if those laws ever change with being able to dispose of them if whatever method of disposal is selected. Okay, I think we addressed this, but a couple more questions have come in about the use of staffing costs. So even in the two year relaxing the restrictions, so do you have concerns about including staffing in the definition of direct care costs? And then there was a more um, extensive that prior to the exceptions currently in place for the next two years, you know, so they're going to be back in April of 2022. Is it not valid about the staffing costs? There's a lot of questions about the staffing <laughs> and storage with use of deaccession funds that have come in. So in the definition of direct care from the AMD. It sounded like that IMA was fine using the accession costs for staffing. So just to reiterate, since these were term positions and the application of direct care in the level in which we were seeking to give these objects couldn't be accomplished otherwise, then we, through our reading of the AAM statement, in 2016 felt that that applied. Uh, there aren't permanent full-time staff though who receive funds from, from deaccession. So it's the project specialists that are directly um, 
impacting our collections through their care and their processing of them for deaccession. Great, thank you. Um, is, do you know if the name of the museum is used in the auction listing? Absolutely, yep. Okay, and do, do, do. thank you guys. Everyone's been giving so many questions, it's hard to get through them all. <laughs> Appreciate people's patience. And also the contact information is hopefully still shown. Um, there was for you, Jennifer, if you're planning on writing a book, on your experience <laughs> with the accessioning <laughs> and tips. Also, you were lauded for that you should give a webinar on managing your volunteers <laughs> <laughs> for future. <laughs> uh, this is a question that I just think is fun. Is there an end point to this project or will you return to the beginning and reassess the collection again? What? There is no end. It keeps on going. Um, as, as I had mentioned, all acquisitions, gifts, purchases, however an object's coming into the museum, now requires a rank and then a rationale, which is typical for an acquisition or acquisition rationale. So that is now put into the database where the ranking information is. So everything continues to be ranked. But we're still collecting. So and, and all of our storage is still on site and it's not gonna get any bigger. So I think a lot of institutions as they continue to collect kind of encounter that problem. Um, you don't wanna stop collecting as, as an institution whose goal is to continue to bring these interesting and, and fascinating objects to the public. So yes, we're continuing to refine. We have not deaccessioned everything that we had marked as thus because our collection's large and there's only so much we can do at a time. So um, the project, while everything is ranked, our deaccessioning procedures and program is, is not stopped. Okay, um, coming up towards the end, I'm going to just do one more question and I do see that we still have over 20 questions. <laughs> so this is clearly a great session. So I just want to thank you three again for taking the time and being so thoughtful with all your responses. Sorry if I was asking any redundant questions, sort of hard for me to keep track of everything. I do encourage everyone that's on the webinar, these are all fantastic questions and that we do have the CSAAM listserv, which I definitely know that Robin, Ann, and Jennifer are on. And so that's a great way to also crowdsource responses. And I think because they shared their emails that they also may be willing to answer your questions <laughs> through their newfield.org email addresses. So again, I just wanna share a heartfelt thank you everyone for participating today. This is a hot topic given AAMD's um, new policies and the times that we're existing in. So I'm just gonna quickly ask the last question. Uh, do you, uh, what do you do with your, uh, let's see, where did that one go? So many questions are coming in. <laughs> um, do you still collect items that would have a C ranking? And why would it be a good object to keep in the collection? I assume rationale would only allow for A and B only. Well, you would be right. We are not collecting objects that are ranked a C and uh, we do find that having a ranking system and then a follow-up to that, a collecting plan in place has really helped us dissuade eager donors who might have objects that they very much want new fields to become the stewards of. Um, by having these parameters, we can say, you know, this is the direction the museum's going. These are the choices that we've made as a collecting institution. Um, and it certainly gives a little more weight to say, and ability to say no to precious gifts you might not necessarily want in your institution. Um, but see objects remaining in the collection that are already here, um, it really depends on the object. Sometimes it might relate to something else that is an A, or maybe it is the only example we have by an artist that we would very much like to keep in the institution. It really is case by case and, and greatly depends on, on the, the collection. So, you know, it might be a suite of prints and five are Bs, but one is a C, but you wouldn't want to break up the suite. So obviously you'll keep the C. So um, Cs are very case by case. 
Great. Well, we are at time. And again, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your expertise in this process. Clearly been very well thought out and it's great to have your expertise to share with the field. Uh, so again, thank you. I just want to do a quick plug that we do have another webinar tomorrow, same time, same place. Uh, so please join. It's Collections Conundrums. It's usually full of a lot of laughs and like, ah, <laughs> how does this still happen? So please, uh, you can go to our Collection Stewardship website to sign up for that one as well. And with that, I believe I'm going to stop <laughs> this. So hopefully everyone has a wonderful Wednesday. And thank you again. <laughs>